Okay. All right. So I want to talk about a model of local computation algorithms, and I want to give a sense of the types of results we got within this model. Uh, so, um, so let's start with the context. The context is, okay, you have huge data. You don't have time to read all the data, but you need to somehow compute some parameter of this data, okay? Um, but not only is your input extremely large, but also your output might be extremely large. Okay, so the, what I want to talk about today is the setting when um, you have this large output you need to compute, but you don't actually need the whole output. You just need a piece of it, okay? And if you only need a piece of the output, do you actually have to compute the whole thing and then just look at the piece that you need? Or is there some way that you can just compute what you need, okay? So in fact, even more so, the question is whether you can not even look at all of the input. Okay, so we're interested in sublinear time algorithms, algorithms whose running time is um, very small compared to the size of the input and very small compared to the size of the output as well. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. I'd like to give some examples. Um, and these are, these are examples that fit within the paradigm uh, that I'm going to be discussing today that have been around for a long time. Uh, so, for example, in coding theory, they had locally decodable codes where the input you think of as an encoding of a large message. The output of the decoding algorithm is the original large message. But maybe you don't actually need, I mean, so this is huge, this is huge, but maybe you don't need to actually, you don't, maybe you don't need the whole original message. Maybe you just want to know what's the ith bit, okay? Or, you know, a few of the bits of the original large message. Now the question is, do you need to decode the whole message in order to just get the pieces that you need, okay? And it turns out you don't. You know, you can design really good codes for which very few queries are needed in order to compute the answer, okay? So this is like, you know, a coup of the theory community, great. There has been a lot of work that's just a couple of citations. There's a million citations to put up there. Okay, a similar thing was done for decompression. So the, here the input is the compression of a large piece of data, the output, is the, of the decompression algorithm is the original large data. Um, but maybe you don't want, you know, you want to make some computation on the original data. You don't need to know the whole data. You just, th you need certain pieces. Maybe you needed to do binary search to see if, you know, Dick Carp is in your list, for example. Uh, so you just need to answer queries of the type, what is the ith bit? Do you need to actually decompress the whole input? And the answer is, well, depending on the compression scheme, but basically no. There are compression schemes which compress well, at least as compared to various you know, standard compression schemes. And there are very few queries to answer these site types of questions, okay? So just, I want to just mention a quest, um, an application. Maybe you have like a gene bank. It's growing information. It's huge. You don't want to recompress every time you added a few more genes to your gene bank. Um, and these sequences are highly redundant, both within the DNA sequence and also between people's DNA sequences. So it's a great place for online compression. But you know, if you want to run some bioinformatics algorithm, you don't want to decompress the whole thing. Okay. So that's an example. Um, now let me turn to yet a different, um, a third scenario where you might want what we call local algorithms. And this is in graph partitioning and page rank. Here, for example, you might have a huge graph. You know you know, the, net, um, the Facebook graph or something like that, and you want to find communities. So you want to find uh, a good cut near a certain node V where the runtime depends only on the size of the small side of the cut, or you might want to estimate the page rank of V, or you may want to do some sort of spam detection or community detection. So there's been a number of works on these sorts of models as well. Um, and perhaps also as a methodology for denoising data, here, uh, you have an in, you were given an input which should have some useful property, but it's been slightly corrupted and no longer has this property. So you would like to you would like to correct your input so it's close to the original input, but also has this sort of expected property. But you'd like to also do it in such a way that the original values are quickly accessible. Okay, so this is something I realize now I forgot to fix. So you're going to have to bear with me a slight bug in my. Uh, PowerPoint thing. Okay, so but let's say this is your original data. Okay, yeah, this is this is your original data. Okay, <laughs> uh, so this is um, so this is your original data. Uh, but the thing was supposed to be monotone. 
Okay, so some of these got corrupted, like these guys. Maybe this one too. Um, so what you'd like to do, okay, you'd like to give random access to the real values of the list, or at least some possible real values of the list. Okay, so you'd like to, uh, okay, th this is not supposed to be there. And uh, so you'd like to sort of correct the list to something like that, okay? Um, but let me just point out that it's not so clear, uh, like if, if you're asked for random access, you're trying to figure out how to fix this. You need to say, okay, do I need to just fix it so it's between these two? Or do I need to go further out and look at whether it's between these two? Um, and then the question is, how, far, how much farther out do I need to go in order to determine this? It turns out this is a problem that can be solved actually in logarithmic time. Okay, so it's not, it's not uh, an obvious algorithm. Um, although it may look obvious from this example, it's actually not so obvious. Um, and Okay, and so you can fix this in such a way that it provides local access. In logarithmic time, you can correct, the, you can correct each point of the data. Um, and, and in the end, you'll return according to some monotone function. So, so, it's, so when I say it's a paradigm for correcting data, I mean, you know, what would be the correct data? It's not really clear. You're told that this thing was supposed to be monotone. You see that it's not. Um, so maybe a natural thing to do would be to correct to the closest monotone function or to a close monotone function. And given that, this is something that is doable. Okay, so I'm not sure if that's what you would consider denoising the data, but if this ever turned out to be what you would consider denoising the data, you can do it. Okay, that's I think my main point here. So you define closeness here? <laughs> you, uh, here it's Hamming distance, but if you want to turn it into L1 distance, I think you can actually do better than logarithmic, um, or maybe that's an open question. Uh, so, a, okay. So, so does this say that you can also check if the list is monotone? You can check if a list is close to monotone in uh, logarithmic time, in close in Hamming distance. Also by this result or not? So this result is actually, I would say that the check, the list is close is, um, first of all, it came uh, at least 10 years earlier than this result. So, uh, and I would say it's easier. So the property testing, like testing the property of whether a list is close to monotone is something that can be done in logarithmic time as well. Um, that was one of the first property testers. And I, I would say that's easier. The question was if the two results are related. Um, so similar authors. One of them is easier. <laughs> it's um, the, the related in the sense, I, I would say not always. The that What's that? The technique is related. But the proof in so can you use this algorithm to do the testing, even though the testing is easier? Can you actually use this algorithm to do the testing? That yes, uh, okay. and that and actually that you can do a stronger form of testing. Uh, so yes, you you can use it to do testing, and you can even do a stronger form of testing. Um, I would say that the algorithm used here is inspired by, um, but but not as clear cut as the testing algorithm. And that is because it does do something stronger. OK, so there's a bunch of properties that can be reconstructed. Monotonicity, Lipschitz conditions, convexity. Um, in graphs, you can do corrections. Um, you can turn a graph that may have had some edges broken, but you can turn it back into an expander graph. Uh, you can turn graphs into like graphs that aren't quite connected. You can make them connected by adding just a few edges. In a local manner, you don't have to look at the whole graph in order to do this. Uh, K connectivity, small diameter. Um, so what I want to talk about now is maybe let's suggest a good unifying model, which sort of gets at all these different types of problems. Um, so here you've got some input X, and this is actually written down, okay? And now in your head, I mean not maybe, unfortunately maybe not in my head, but somebody's head, there's an output Y. And this is what the algorithm wants to compute, okay? But it actually just needs pieces of it. So now, we have this thing which we'll call the local computation algorithm. And it gets inputs like i1, i2, i3. And it's supposed to answer with what's the output of y at location i1, i2, i3. OK, so it's, supposed, it's sort of an online thing that's you're giving it queries and it's outputting answers. OK, and this guy, this LCA, can make queries, random access queries to the input wherever he wants. Um, and you know nobody can query this because it's not there. It's not. It's not written. But this is what we're trying to compute. But you could you could query the input. 
you don't have time to read the whole thing, but you can look at any location in the input that you'd like. Okay, so I just want to, just to make this more concrete, let's use a running example of maximal independent set. And just so that we're all on the same page, let's define maximal independent set. You're giving a sparse undirected graph. The I'm going to assume that the degree is at most d. Um, so d, and, that's, and we're also going to assume that d is a constant for today, although it doesn't have to be. Um, and in, an independent set is a subset of the nodes where no two are connected by an edge. Okay, so all these red guys, there are no edges between red guys. And maximal means that you can't add another, you can't add another node to this red set without violating the independence. Okay, so if I add any other node, then I'm not going to have this um, property where there's no two edges <coughs> connecting a red node. Okay, so that's independent set. Maximal is that I can't add anything to it. And how do you compute this thing? Okay, uh, so what I'd like actually is here's my input. It's the graph. I'd like to make queries to the graph, and and then, and what the local computation algorithm should do is, given some node v, ask tell me or some node u, tell me is u in the maximal independent set, okay? And I'd like to do this without looking at the whole graph, okay? So this seems pretty trivial because here's what we could do. I'm going to call this the lazy greedy algorithm because it's very lazy. I'm going to ask. Is node u in the maximal independent set? And you know, u is always in some maximal independent set. So actually, before we get to this, let's do an even lazier thing. Let me just always say yes, right? u is always in some maximal independent set. What's the problem with that? Be the question isn't whether u is in some maximal independent set. It's in a particular output whether u is in a maximal independent set. So the problem is that if I ask queries about other nodes, I need to remain consistent. OK, so then, all right, still no problem. Because what I'll do is I'll just keep track of the answers I've given so far. OK, so I'll ask, is node u in the maximum, maximal independent set? And the answer will be, if the neighbors of u have not yet been put in the maximal independent set, I'll put it there. OK, and then I'll just remember all the choices I made, and I'm done. All right, well, the requirements for this are I need order d times per query, because I have to look at all my neighbors. And we said that the degree was bounded by d. And I need order n space, because I need to remember every previous query I made. And you know, as this thing runs, it's going to take some time. All right, so other problems with this. The, the space is large. Also, the answer depends on the query order. You know, if you ask me about node u before node v, I might give you a different answer. Well, so I have to. I have to remember all my past choices, and I cannot allow simultaneous and non-interacting copies of these um, local computation algorithms to like, work, be working out there in the cloud. Okay, so I'm not even talking about parallel algorithms. I'm talking about two copies of the algorithms that aren't talking to each other and not helping each other either, but uh, running out there. Yeah. I'm just slightly confused about what the input is. Wouldn't the input be also a labeling of which nodes are in the independent set? Or no, no, the input is, is just a graph. Yeah, but you're not seeing the whole graph at once. So when you query, don't you get a node and then also see whether it's in the independent set or not? No, no, I decide that. But I have to decide that in a way that's consistent with, like, if a copy of me had been deciding about my neighbor. I need to be, you know, but the copy of me, like, um, I don't want to communicate all possible graphs. And I, I also need, you know, I haven't seen the whole graph, so I don't even know the whole input. So if someone gave a separate query sequence that query that you don't know about, but they query the neighbors of the node that you said was in the independent set, they better all be out. That's right. And so that's what's the problem with this solution. So does this mean that you have to uh, be oblivious to uh, queries? To query order, yes. Yes, that's what, well, that's what we'd like. If you have that, that's what we'd like. OK? So that's what the model would like. But you know, um, so that's a problem with this type of, yeah. The algorithm you're trying to emulate, the hidden one, I guess is non-deterministic. Is that what's happening? Uh, let me get to what the uh, algorithm I, I'm going to try to, in this talk, I'm going to emulate several algorithms. Okay. In this case, you're not emulating a function. You're not finding the output of the function. Because the algorithm could produce anything as long as it remains consistent. That's right. 
So you're already in a class of hybrid problems as opposed to a class where it's a function. That's right. So I'd like to turn it into a function that I want to compute. As, you, as you're pointing out that in some sense, this is not good. And so let's make it just a function that I want to compute in some way. Okay? Uh, and I wanted a function that I can compute quickly. All right. So we'd like to avoid these problems. So um, let me just say, you know, in nature, it seems like people have avoided these problems. So here's an example. Uh, I, well, uh, you know, I, I think this slide was meant to say maximal independent set, although it's a toy example. It's not really a toy example because it's an important uh, tool in distributed computing. It's uh, used in optimization. It's, um, you know, this is a picture of Drosophila brain development, and somehow these cells uh, can figure out, there's, they try to elect leader cells, and these cells kind of figure out um, who's going to be a leader cell in such a way that the neighbors aren't choos choosing to be leader cells. So they seem to be doing some sort of maximal independent set computation, or at least that's what this effect at all paper seems to be claiming. So, uh, you know, somebody can do it, okay? So, <laughs> Maximal or some independence that's large? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, would, I would refer you to the paper. But they are claiming maximal independence set, but I, maybe it's just large. Uh, and maybe it's not that independent. But I don't know. <laughs> OK, so the main, I, I hope what we've agreed on until now, the main challenge is to be consistent, OK? Well, this has come up before. Um, oh, I was, OK, so let me go back to the model. Now that we have this example, um, here we, what's interesting, so the main challenge is to be consistent with a particular solution. So that was what was sort of missing from the previous slide of the model. Here we have an input x of size n. There's a set of legal solutions, y1 through ys. You've got to pick one and stay consistent with that solution. OK, so this local computation algorithm has to decide to give you access to some y sub k. Um, and it, it should answer any sequence of queries with at most t of n time per query and use at most s of n space, and hopefully these guys are sublinear. Um, and it should also be correct for all queries with probability 1 minus delta of n. So there's some, these are going to be randomized. There might be some probability that everybody messes up, um, but you'd like to be able to control this and make this small. Like, we're hoping that delta would be something like 1 over n or 1 over some... Yeah, something really, really small. Okay, so okay, so this is kind of a picture. That's the input. That's the local computation algorithm. It's thinking of some output. There are s different options. It flips a random string and uses that to pick the option that it's going to answer according to. And then once it picks that random string, it's always going to output according to the same solution. Okay, so it's always. It, it's always going to give you answers according to a single yk. Okay, so that's sort of the idea of the model. All right? Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, we talked about this. Um, okay, I guess the, the one point here is that the idea is if you think of it as swarms of these LCAs out there in the cloud, then you think of them initially sharing some random string, hopefully not too large, and afterwards they can compute independently. They don't need to talk to each other. Okay. <laughs> So now, okay, so now what I want to talk about is how do we design these things, okay? So I, I want to just sort of survey a bunch of techniques that people have used, and, and I'll use, um, <laughs> and they've applied them all to maximal independent sets, so I can sort of, of, um, sort of take you through it. Most of, the, most of the ideas have been applied to maximal independent set one way or another, so we'll just keep going there. Okay, so the hope is you're going to try to find some like normal maximal independent set algorithm that's not local at all. Um, and let's call that algorithm A. And you're going to hope that A's answer depends on only a few inputs to determine how it answers for V. And if you had such a thing, then you would just simulate this special algorithm that only looks at a few inputs, um, simulate A's behavior for V. Okay, so that would be the hope. But how do you get such an A which only looks at a few inputs? That's sort of like that's our whole goal. Yeah. So you're not low in preprocessing? No, no preprocessing. Uh, okay, so the hope is somehow this A looks only at a neighborhood around V. That would be great. Well, idea number one is sort of to use what's known in distributed algorithms, and which is a lot, actually. Okay, so 
It turns out, and this is an observation of Parnas and Ron, but it actually is very powerful observation and is used in a lot of in a lot of the design of local computation algorithms and as well as a lot of property testers, which is if there's a K-round distributed algorithm for maximal independent set, then um, these output only depends on the inputs. Wait, let's make the picture. You've got a K-round algorithm. Now, this is the local distributed model. Okay, so the local distributed model is not to be confused with this, the local sequential model. Because in the local distributed model, they're actually, you know, it's a bunch of processors working together. Okay, so it's, it's not sequential. But in the local distributed model, there has been a lot of great work done in the last 15 years. Um, I mean, it's a lot of great work done since, it's a, since it started. But in the last 15 years, there's been a ton of problems that can be solved in the local distributed model. And we can take advantage of their successes and kind of bring them over to our world. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. But why, why does it help to have a local distributed algorithm? Well, if you have a K-round distributed algorithm, um, and just for those of you that are not used to distributed algorithms, let me tell you something about that that it took me a little bit to understand. Okay, so when you have a distributed algorithm, the input is actually the graph that you're trying to compute the parameter for. Okay, so, so that, I mean, the, the communication graph and the input graph are identical. So that's something that may not be obvious if you haven't seen distributed algorithms before. Uh, and so if you're computing a maximal independent set on a graph, it's exactly the communication graph that you're computing it for. So that's one thing. Um, and now if you have a local K local algorithm, it means you run in K rounds. That's it. Okay. So that means that my input can only depend on, on input bits. I mean, sorry, my output can only depend on inputs that were in a K ball around me. Okay. So because I can only get messages from K steps away from me. Um, you know, in K rounds, I can only get messages that were K steps away from me. That's the most I can see. I can only be influenced by the K ball. Okay. Well, we assumed an upper bound D on the degree. So the size of my K radius ball is at most D to the K. Okay. So I can read this whole yellow section in D to the K queries. I'm, I'm now in a sequential model. Okay. So I'm going to look at all these inputs in D to the K time simulate what the distributed algorithm would have done and figure out what the answer would be for me according to the distributed algorithm. But now I'm just simulating in D to the K sequential time. Okay, so it's a K round distributed algorithm. I'm simulating all the work that it would have done in D to the K sequential time. So it's an exponential blow up, but we were assuming D is a constant and we were assuming K is a constant. So so that's why it's okay. Now, that's the beauty of these local algorithms is k is a constant. Okay, so that's, um, so k is not so bad. All right, are we following here? Yeah. Questions? Uh, I have yeah. a question. Uh, <clears throat> the individual nodes have names. And if the names came from a totally ordered set, you'd have a trivial algorithm just look at any node and see if its name was bigger than the names of all of its neighbors. That's at maximum. OK. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, um, maybe I'll use the board for that in a minute. Yeah. So give me a minute. I th it's, a great, it's a great question. OK. So you, you could have a sorted, uh, yeah. just the lines. Yeah. Uh, and the labels are sorted along the line. So uh, this algorithm will output only one node. Oh, I see. So, okay, maybe, am I allowed to use this? Okay. Do it, so it's right it. I <laughs> <laughs> remember somebody once did that at ICSI. Remember? Yeah, yeah that was a Hugo. Hugo. And a. And, and after he did that, he said, well, you'll remember me for a long time. And sure enough, we did. <laughs> we did. Okay, so, yeah, so I think this is the example. Um, yeah, I see. Uh, so you could have like one to a thousand, uh, but right. And so, but you need to know the parity of how many people came before you, and if one edge was missing, that could change the whole parity. Uh, and so you really, so it doesn't solve the problem, but it, it's a good, it's but a good thought. Hold that thought. I mean, you could also have, I've thought about this also earlier, but you could have two paths of opposite parity to a local minimum. So you, it's not like there's one parity for every node. 
But, but there's a, I mean, even that's bad enough because you would have to check that each edge is there. Uh, but the two path case is uh, also bad. So we'll get to this, okay? But, um, but right now we're just using distributed algorithms first. And so local, local distributed algorithms are constant rounds. There's a ton of them. There's been great work in distributed algorithms, finding local algorithms. They can do a lot of things. They can do, uh, they can do packing problems, covering problems. They can do a, a well, so in, that's the kind of most general case, but you know, they can do things like set cover. They can do vertex cover. They can do, you know, they have a really very powerful algorithms in the local model, matching um, or like large matchings. And, uh, so that's really good news for local computation algorithms because now we have like one, you know, we can just basically import all the d results from local distributed algorithms and, con and construct a whole bunch of local computation algorithms. Okay, so that's technique one. Um, and, you know, so we can talk about what does this tell us for maximal independent set? Well, if you just took, uh, this is not actually local because it's d log n instead of just, um, but if you just took Luby's algorithm for maximal independent set, there's Luby right there, and uh, you, you would get something that's not quite uh, what you wanted because you get this 2 to the d log d log n up, in this, up here, and that's not good because it's not sublinear. Um, so that doesn't seem like it works, but, okay, but I'm going to tell you later, with additional ideas and different algorithms, we can do a lot better, um, including taking the idea from this algorithm and using it to do other things, which I'll mention in the next slide. Okay, so I just want to say uh, there's been a whole slew of work in this direction, improving maximal independent set based on flat out distributed algorithms. Okay, um, and I should also mention uh, that in this recent paper of Gaffari and also some work, um, where are they? A Baron Boym et al. Uh, actually, ideas from local computation algorithms have been used to improve local distributed algorithms. So there's been sort of an interplay in the two communities um, over the last few years. Okay, so idea number two is kind of like distributed algorithms, but it's to use distributed algorithms plus another idea. Okay, and here we'd like to use distributed algorithms to kind of break up the graph into really small pieces, and then we can do something sequential on what's left. Okay, so. Here's an example for MIS. Um, we're going to basically run D round, order D rounds of a variant of Luby's algorithm. Okay, so just f what does Luby's algorithm do? It says, okay, I'm going to mark myself with probability one over twice my degree, and then I'm going to look around at my neighbors and see did any of them mark themselves. And if none of them marked themselves, then I put myself in the maximal independent set. Okay, so that's Luby's algorithm, um, and. If any of them did mark themselves, then we all unmark ourselves. Okay, so that's the algorithm. Um, and can, you need to run this thing d log n times um, in order to analyze it, but what if you just run it order d rounds? What happens then? Okay, so you're gonna get rid of a large fraction of the nodes. But better than that, it's not just that the number of nodes you get, get rid of is gonna be, um, is gonna be mostly, is gonna be a large fraction of the nodes, you're also going to get rid of them in a nice pattern. Okay, so what's going to happen is what remains are small connected components. So you're actually going to break up the graph into small tiny pieces that are, say, polylogarithmic in length. And then, you know, in phase two, you can go through these little pieces and do some kind of brute force sequential algorithm. Okay, so that's the idea here. Um, and and so to. So the way you're running the randomized algorithm, uh, I guess. To satisfy your previous condition, you need all the copies of this algorithm to be using the same random bits. That's right. That's right. And if there are a lot of them, then some of them will fail. Right. So there, we're going to use log n wise independence, mm -hmm. and that's going to save us a lot of random bits that we have to share. Okay, and th that's going to be enough because no no section looks at more than that. Okay. So so what this local computation algorithm would do would be to first simulate V's local view of the distributed algorithm running order D rounds, D, um, rounds of Luby's algorithm. And then, you know, once we're done with that, we have to figure out who my connected component is that remains. So I'm going to, like, I'm going to figure out locally what the distributed algorithm would say about me. Am I in the maximal independent set or should I, um, or am I still alive? And I would then check my neighbors and I would keep checking my neighbors, neighbors, five minutes, good. Okay, and that's what I would do. 
Okay, so um, this idea, you know, was further used by other uh, others in this whole framework. Okay, so then also you have to argue um, that what's you know that you don't have to go that far to figure out who's in your live connected component, and you argue that based um, on an on an argument that's very similar to Beck's not very similar. It's almost identical to Beck's algorithm, Beck, Beck's argument about a, analyzing the Lovas local lemma algorithm. Okay, so. Uh, so if you use that, then you can, you can get this bound on the sizes of the, of the components. And this kind of idea, this sort of framework, was used as well in um, distributed algorithms. OK. All right, so another idea in my two remaining minutes is uh, Dick's idea, which is to simulate the greedy approach. OK? Um, so if you like simulate sequential greedy, as Dick suggested, then you would run through the nodes. Okay, this is now the sequential algorithm. I just want to be, we should all agree what this sequential algorithm does and then see how we can simulate it. The sequential algorithm would run through the nodes in some order, maybe one through, I mean, maybe alphabetical order or some other order. Um, and now what we'll do is we'll put our node V into the maximal independent set if none of its neighbors have been put in the maximal independent set yet. Okay, and that's the algorithm Dick was suggesting. Um, and now the, the LCA is supposed to compute what would greedy do on you, on node u. Okay, so I'm given a query u, is u in the maximal independent set? I have to figure out would greedy have put me in or not. So I have to look at all my lower numbered neighbors. According to this, I have to look at all my lower numbered neighbors and see if greedy put them in the maximal independent set because if any of them are put in the maximal independent set, I can't go in. Okay. And in order to figure out if they were put in the maximal independent set, I have to look at their lower numbered neighbors to figure out if Greedy had previously placed them in the maximal independent set. This could go on forever. And in this example, basically, to figure out if this guy's in the maximal independent set, I have to look at his neighbor. Um, to figure out if he's in the maximal independent set, I have to look at his neighbor, and so on, all the way down the line. So this is a really bad ordering for that particular graph. OK? So, but the thing to notice is it's independent of you know, I don't have to look at anything that's numbered higher than me in the ordering because I know that Greedy hasn't put them in the maximal independent set because it hasn't even looked at it yet. Greedy goes through them in a specific order. Okay, so the problem with Greedy is in general the dependency chains of this kind of reasoning could be really long, but if the order were picked randomly, then you can show, and Nguyen and Onak showed this in um, a slightly different context, but not very different context, um, that you can show that the order, that the dependency chains are not going to be long, okay? And uh, so you can show that these dependency chains are short if the if the ranks of the if the names of the elements were chosen randomly, and um, you can show it using some Galton-Watson branching process ideas, uh, and a, and in fact that's another technique that people use to construct local algorithms. Okay, and you've all already asked me about the space requirements for the random bits, and we'll use KY's independence. Okay. Now, there's a bunch of works improving MIS uh, using all kinds of ideas, using better distributed protocols, better, I, I don't even have time to get into this, but uh, uh, okay, so let's just, just say um, that the main open question, it's gotten all the way down to quasi-polynomial in the degree, and the big question is, can you get polynomial in D dependence? But right now, the dependence on n can be either be log star n and exponential in the degree, or log cubed n and quasi-poly in the degree. So that seems to be the best. OK. Um, I should mention that th many other problems have been looked at. Approximate maximum matching, so it's not maximum, but getting close to a large matching. Uh, rate, um, certain kinds of scheduling problems, hypergraph coloring, KCNF, uh, local computation mechanism design has been looked at, and various online algorithms such as load balancing with balls and bins. Um, and in all these cases, you get polylog query and space complexity. Um, here's something I'm not going to talk about, but let me, let me just say the problem. Suppose you're given a graph and you'd like to identify the edges that are in some spanning tree. Okay. Turns out this problem in general um, you know, is has an omega n lower bound, but you can do things like find sparse spanning trees on some graphs. Okay, so I, so it's, I think it's a good set of open questions. We don't know how to do it in general, but we can find sparse spanning trees that kind of connect a graph, don't have more than one plus epsilon 
and edges. Okay, so they have, they're more than trees, they do have extra edges, but they don't have more than epsilon and extra edges over a tree, okay? Um, and so you'd like to do this. Uh, there's a lower bound of root n for general graphs, uh, for special case graphs like hyperfinite graphs and, the, and other kind of really non-expanding graphs, then you can get constant in terms of n and quasi-poly in terms of the degree. Um, and for certain kinds of very nice expanding graphs, you can get root n uh, kind of near the lower bound. So I think I'm past my time. Um, so let me just say, uh, as far as the model, I guess we don't need this. Um, I, I just want to say that some work has been, how many minutes do I have? Zero, right? Negative one. OK. Uh, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I just want to say, as far as the model, uh, the, in our model, we allowed sort of random access to the input. We didn't require that, as you would in distributed algorithms, that you can only do essentially search it, like you can start at node u and you can look at the neighbors, the neighbors of the neighbors, um, and so on. Uh, the question is, do non-local probes help? Um, for, graph, for graphs, for at least some large, nice graph, class of graph problems, the answer is no, the non-local probes don't actually help. But I don't know if this is true for all graph problems. Um, and this is really only a result for graphs. Uh, and uh, I guess, um, if you like the picture, one takeaway message I hope that you get from this is that you can kind of kill several birds with one stone, meaning that the space, the simultaneous consi consistency, and the history independent all seem related. So like you fix one, you fix them all in some sense. Uh, I don't have a theorem that says they should be related, but, uh, but it seems somehow that that's what happened. Um, there's a lot of open questions here. Uh, and I think the most interesting open question is, new problems. Uh, you can always improve on the old problems and get an even better maximal independent set result. But uh, I think how, how, to, um, how to apply this kind of model to new problems is uh, the most exciting thing. So thank you. <laughs> I do have one comment. In the original MIS paper, one of the algorithms was to pick a random uh, label for each of the nodes and then just do the maximal independent set according to which one lowest among its neighbors, then it's in. And so that's very similar to what you So suggest. actually, uh, and, some, and some of those, OK. So there, uh, there are a lot of maximal independent sets that have been the, so this, your algorithm and variance of is like, well, half the internet. And uh, all of them have been analyzed <laughs> in, those, in that list of uh, things. But I didn't have time to talk about it. Yeah, no, I just <laughs> mentioned that one in particular. Yeah. Very magical. Uh, <laughs>